Welcome to our Israel Vision People and Places talk show. Today you're in for a big treat. Our guest, Karen Dunham, is from sunny Florida in the United States, and she came to Israel several years ago as a single mom to serve the peoples here, both Jew and Arab alike. And lately she's been used mightily among the Palestinian refugees inside Jericho in giving them food, clothing, and comfort. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Pastor Karen. Karen, we're so thrilled that you've been able to come up and be with us for just a little minute. And we know that your heart is brimming over. So my first question is, what did you hear the Lord say to you in the old city of Jerusalem during the Iraq war? Um, he asked me to go to Jericho and to move into a refugee camp. And he said, if, he said that he gave me a scripture. He said, I'm sending you there. And I asked him, why Jericho? because I had so many bad things about Jericho. The Jews really didn't have any interest left in Jericho because Joshua had cursed it. And the Arabs felt like it was a filthy place. Religious Arabs do not visit Jericho. So he asked me to go there and I said, why Jericho, God? And he said, because of what's written long ago. And then he showed me the scripture in Hosea where he was gonna turn the Valley of Achor into a door of hope. Tell me about the Valley of Achor. What is the biblical reference? Valley of Achor is when uh, Achan got stoned, okay, for stealing the gold and the silver and the Babylonian garments. And they stoned uh, Achan, and Israel had, was, had lost that battle because there was um, this sin in the camp. And so the Lord says in Hosea 2.15, I'm going to or 223, I'm going to turn the valley of Achor into a door of help. And then he says in 223, Hosea, I'm going to call a people, not my people. I'm going to say, you are my people. And they're going to say, you are my God. How have you been received there? When I first moved into the camp, um, <clears throat> they come over, the refugees, okay? Nobody would rent to us in the whole city of Jericho, first of all. They Who's were uh, me and my young son. I had my son with me, he was 15 years old. And everybody was afraid of us because the Iraqi war was going on. There was no Americans anywhere in Jericho. And so the only place we could find to live was in the refugee camp. And this was God just getting us there. And of course we paid double what the Arabs pay for this you know, mess in the refugee camp. And so we rented the house there and the people come the refugees, and they said never in all their dream did they dream that they would be living next door to an American in a refugee camp. And so we were really the foolish thing of God, me and my son. They laughed because I didn't have a husband. They laughed because I didn't know the language. And I laughed, you know, I mean, I laughed. I thought, Lord, we, we really are the <laughs> foolish thing of God. And so he sent us into the camp um, and had us give out clothing and rice. And we give out a gospel, something, you know, to, or a New Testament, something with the Bible in everything that goes out of there, in clothing and food. This is what God told me to do. And of course, we suffered um, oil bombs and death threats and stoning. And it was quite, it took everything that I have for God to stay. I want to ask a question. I know that uh, they called on the minarets in Arabic concerning you, the imams, the, the Muslim leaders. Now, they called you in for a visit, and what did they say? Well, after everybody in town was talking about us because we did a big food giveaway, and so now maybe 2,000 New Testaments just went out the city, and the sheikhs were very uh, concerned about it, and they were talking to on all the mosque about it. But when they called me for a meeting um, over in Aqua Java camp, uh, they asked me to go, and I was there with Islamic teachers, and they started asking me about the slip that goes in the bag. And I told them, I says, I work for the church, and that is the sign of the church, and I'm going to obey, you know, the head of the church, which is Christ. So, I mean, I, I told them I was going to obey the Lord. And so I was, and then they wanted me to, of course, give them all the, our supplies and let them hand them out. And I said, no, God wants me to do this. And I told them, I says, nobody would ever move into a refugee camp 
I said, we've killed scorpions, we've been without water, and we have suffered greatly. We've been stoned, death threats, and oil bombs. And I says, nobody takes their child and moves into the refugee camp unless they heard the voice of God. And I said, and I heard the Lord. And the Lord said to go into that refugee camp and help the people. And I told them, I says, if you try to hurt us, you're going to find yourself fighting against the armies of heaven. Because I said, we're there not of our own accord. We're there because the Lord has sent us there. And so what did they say? They, they gave us peace after that. And then unfortunately, um, one of the leaders was assassinated right after that, uh, the first leader that in this last year. And so they, never, they no longer spoke about us on the mosque, in the mosque. They had much more... Uh, important issues to handle. And so now, uh, this last year, we've only been on the attention of the mosque, maybe one time. But everybody in the Palestinian Authority knows we give out a gospel with the food and the clothing, and they've accepted this. Didn't they say that, well, if the Red Cross does this or something, what did they say? They said if the Red Cross puts their name on a bag, then the church has every right to put something about the church in the clothing and in the food. What the name of the Lord. Yes. <laughs> what questions have come back from people that have read those scripture portions in Arabic? Oh, they've rung the door and says, I understand everything, but can you tell me who the Father is? Now, why is that? Um, they just have the, this interest on who this Father is. Um, I did have New Year's Day. I had a man there with 20 children and two wives. And they came to me, they were in Jericho, and they wanted to know about Christ. And they wanted to know if he was dead, how's he, how can he be alive? So the men in Jericho from the city center brought him to the church. And so we're in the church, and they're asking me these questions. So I show them the last 30 minutes of the Jesus video, that you know, real old Jesus video, where he rose from the dead. And they sat there, and the power of God just come into the room, and the man with two ch 20 children and two wives, he looked at me and he said, what about me? What about me in this kingdom? And I said, my father said, you're welcome. You're welcome. You come as you are. So this is, there's some issues, you know, when they're interested in the kingdom and coming into the kingdom because they have, they, they don't date in their culture. In fact, the young boys have come to me and said, you need to find us a bride. Now, usually they said, you know, if I get out of school and I don't have a bride, my father, who's an Islamic priest, is going to grab somebody and I'm going to be married to her. And he says, so you need to find us. You're our pastor. You need to find us a bride. So we need to, we need to build them their own place, their own place. Well, what is in your heart, Karen? Well, the Lord has showed me a piece of land, and we need to build like an old-fashioned soup kitchen so we can feed the children when they get out of the UN school that's across the street, and it's in between the ancient synagogue and Elisha Spring, and it's across the street from the ancient wall. And we'd like to build a church there, and that's where Jesus also healed the man with blind eyes. And so we'd like to build a church there and use it for two purposes, um, to honor God and also to feed the refugee children as they come out of school. And what do you need for that? Well, for that property, we're trying, we're really, you know, praying for God to give us that property, $300,000. And, and then you have to build. And the wonderful thing is it's owned by a Christian and they're allowed to sell it to us. Yes. Right. We need 300 just for the vacant land. But you, it, it is a rule. If a Jew or a Christian buy from a Muslim, then they, they could face serious problems and so this is owned by a Christian who's willing to sell. So we know that this is the piece of property that God has appointed what for us. What about building permits, Karen? Building permits, we won't have any trouble with the Palestinian Authority. I've already talked to the authority. I told them I had a vision. God give me to build a beautiful church there with a soup kitchen. When I said church, everybody got quiet in the room. And it was I like silent. And then when I said we're going to put a soup kitchen in it and we want to bless the people, they said, we can live with it. We can live with it. And to just uh, share with our viewers that you have laid your life on the line also financially. What, what, what did you do when you came here? Well, I was offered a job, my first job. I'd been on the mission field 
in Wales, and I'd been just, you know, barefoot walking with the Lord, and I just got offered my first job uh, preaching for television at JCN TV in San Diego. And the Lord spoke to me and said, go to Jerusalem and pray at the Western Wall. And I thought, you want me to go pray at the Western Wall? And my son is saying, Mom, don't, 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 do, don't lose this, because they had offered me a, a small check, a house, and a car. And my parents were all excited. Everybody was excited that we had a job. And so I emailed the pastor, and I said, God just told me, and I, I was feeling it inside, that I had to go to Jerusalem and pray. Maybe I can come back in a couple weeks. And I was already looking for a three-month return ticket, so I was just, you know, trying to keep my foot in the door. But I really give it to God. I said, God, if this isn't you, just close the door. And the pastor wrote me back and said, you're not part of our team. <laughs> and so the, originally when you went to Jericho, you gave to the people from the savings that you had. Is that correct? Yes, we did. We gave away everything. We had a building. We sold it. And God said, I want to bless them. And I want you to sow and sow and sow. We, did, we had one asset, a building. We went back to the States and sold it and just sowed, 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 and gave it all to the Palestinian people. In, in food and in clothing. In food and in clothing. Now, the army, the Israeli army, heard that we were in the camp, OK? And so they called one of the volunteers and said, we want to find out, how'd you get there? <laughs> and so anyway, we end up having a meeting with them. And they, I just want to say that the, we, they've given us a work permit. So we have a work permit from the Israeli army. But uh, the Ministry of Interior out of Ramallah in the Palestinian side also went to Jerusalem to get the recommendation for us, okay? So both sides have given us a referral, and so we're there with a work permit um, of the Israeli army. Now, if you get uh, the property, will that help you? And you're, you're actually established there uh, as a church with a physical presence that's your own, that will help you on an ongoing basis, is that correct? It'll help us much because being in rented property, I mean, we have uh, sometimes our only problem has been with like the neighbor that's embarrassed that his uh, brother-in-law in Chicago rented to a church. And so, you know, they've tried to put us out quite a few times. And uh, I had a pastor who speaks Arabic there and he said, Karen, I don't want to translate this. Um, this man is telling you he, he loves you, but he wants you out. And I started laughing. I says, well, the devil's been trying to throw me out of Jericho since I got here. Don't feel bad about it, Pastor <laughs> Paul. I said, just tell the man. We'll, we'll pray about it. <laughs> but we knew we weren't going anywhere. We're obeying God. And the favor is so heavy there on both sides. The Palestinians now, when we first come, we suffered because they had never lived in a refugee camp with anybody but Muslims. Now you got a church moved into the camp. I mean, and this was a challenge for them. But through the favor of God, we've grown to love them, and they love us now. And there is many times, Jericho, you know, nobody come in and nobody went out. The Israeli soldiers, I, I want to give a good report on both sides. They have always let us in. They, walking through the checkpoint, they've grabbed my hand and shook hands and said, I might be an Israeli soldier, but I want to thank you for what you're doing for those refugees. And any time we've had cargo, they said, is that for them people? I've said, yes. They said, let them through. And even real high, high alert when nobody goes in, they've always let us bring in cargo for the refugees. Wonderful. What did they say to you? We want you to make the Palestinians... They, asked, they said, we not only want you to bless the Palestinians, we want you to make them, he meant the word comfortable, okay? He says, and we, he says, we support you here. He said, we want you to help those people. The soldier says, I have children who are fat. And he said, and they're not hungry, and they don't go a day without bread. And he said, I want you to feed those people, and we want to stand behind you, and whatever it takes to get those people fed, he says, we want to help you. Well, Karen, we just run right out of time, yes. and we want to continue this on, though, for next week's show, and so we're going to ask the people to tune in. Next week, we're going to, our special guest is going to be Karen Dunham again, so you can hear about this miracle that the Israeli army have said they would like her to do 
the same service in 23 other refugee camps. If you'd like to help, please write in to us. And we're making a special offer this time to you. You can help directly to Karen. Send your checks, Living Bread Church, to us at Israel Vision, and we'll pass them directly on to Karen so she can help those precious, precious people in the refugee camp. And our prayer is that you will do this in obedience to the Lord and you will have peace in your heart and in your home. And so we say that ancient Hebrew prayer together. Shalom from Jerusalem. Shalom. As we found out last week, Israel's lightning victory in just six days over three Arab nations was unique in the annals of world history. The events that happened in Jerusalem during this quite amazing war were of biblical proportions. Let me explain. I remember so vividly the opportunity that I had in 1980 as a young film producer to interview one of the heroes of the Six Day War. His name is General Uzi Narkis. And here's the sequence of that Apples of Gold interview. We did it, I think, because not that we were smarter, not that we knew how to fight better than the Jordanian army here on the Jerusalem front, but our soldiers knew that they were fighting for Jerusalem. It's vitally important to remember that 19 years earlier, Uzi Narkis was the commander of the Israeli forces in Jerusalem. And it was in 1948, in his capacity, that he had to give up the struggle for the holy city, his hometown. And now, 19 years later, he recalls the euphoria that he felt when fate had it, that he would be the overall general of all the Israeli forces in Jerusalem, and that he would be able to reunite his beloved city. For the first time in 2,500 years, Jerusalem was in the hands of the Jewish people. We arrived to the wall, the wall that waited for us for 2,000 years. This was my feeling, that we are back home at last. The reunification of Jerusalem was actually prophesied in the Bible by Jesus. In the Gospel of Luke, chapter 21, verse 24, it says that Jerusalem will be trampled under the feet of the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. So the fact that Jerusalem came back under the authority of the Jewish people in 1967 signaled the beginning of the end of the time of the Gentile domination of the holy city. And this was for the first time in 2,500 years. Now the Apostle Paul also picked up on this theme when he said in Romans 11, Brethren, I don't want you to be wise in your own conceited ways that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in or been completed. And this is a promise of great significance to the Jewish people worldwide and, of course, for the future of Israel. I'm Dr. Jay Rawlings. Join me next week for Factor Fantasy. Shalom. Welcome to our home located here on the hills of Benjamin, just outside of Jerusalem. What do you think when you hear the words, fear not? Well, you think of the Bible because all of the greats in the Bible heard those words every time they had a visitation from the Almighty, which is pretty scary. First, they heard the words, fear not, because the Bible says that it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. I mean, we're just mortal. We're just tiny. We're finite. And he's so different. He's so full of light. And so we have fears. All of us have fears. Perhaps some of us are born into fear, families that have strong strongholds of fear. Let's talk about fear for a moment. Fear is like being stuck in the back of a cave. You can see the light at the opening, but you can't get there because you're too far back. Fear is not a friend. It has power. Fear has pals. 
The pals of fear are anger, lust, blame, shame. Fear will cause us to be cunning in order to cover up our lack, our need, our lie, our loss, our wants, our needs. Have you ever been to someone's home where the music is always blaring? It's always a little too loud? Why is that? Another question. Why are people always so busy, too busy? It's because of emptiness. Spinoza called it a vacuum inside. But we won't stop our frenetic activity in order to face the loneliness or the emptiness because it's scary. To lose control is to let go, and to let go is to let God. And that's what it means to be weak in such a great way. And you know, sometimes we have breakdowns, but we actually call them breakups because it's the healthiest thing that can happen to any of us, is to let down to such a degree that all the things, the fears especially, that have been kept inside and have been kept uh, locked inside and made us prisoners are allowed to be released and come out. This is a breakup. This is health. This is health in progress, and it's good. This is the, pro the process of coming out of the cave, which is a healthy process. We mustn't be afraid of the fear. I want to encourage you to confront your fears, your fears. Don't be concerned about your husband's fears. You can pray for your children's fears, but if you'll deal with yours, you'll be amazed at the stability that will come under your feet and the way you're able to view life and take on new challenges and opportunities without being afraid and feeling so in, inept or unable to do things. And so face your fears. You're not alone. The Lord God says, fear not, I am with you. What have we to fear but fear itself? Speak the word and tell it to get out of your life. It's not welcome. If you'd like to ask us any questions, visit our, visit our beautiful website at hisstillsmallvoice.com.